you know, this, that's, not, that's not how it should be. So these are the eight dimensions of one's character that make up the complete path for living in Buddhism. It's pretty common sense stuff. And, it, and there's nothing in there that goes against Christianity. Because again, this is Buddhism, pure Buddhism is a philosophy, not a religion. <clears throat> and there's no ego. Was it Richard Gere? Buddhist? I don't know. I was it? Actor Richard Gere, yeah. I think, was huh. Buddhist. I know a Quaker who's a Buddhist. Really? Yes. I know a Quaker who's a Buddhist. He's a, he's a devout Quaker, but he's also a Buddhist in philosophy. Not in the religious aspect of Buddhism, but he, he's definitely a Buddhist. <laughs> it's funny. Um, there's no ego in Buddhism because if you're just a wave in the sea, and then you're just part of the sea again, they, there's no ego. So there's not, I mean, it makes them uh, not an arrogant people. Other important teachings. Uh, there's the loving kindness meditation prayer that goes, May all sentient beings have happiness and its causes. Be free from suffering. Never be separated from bliss. Be free of bias, attachment, and anger. And there's a teaching called the Middle Way, and that is non-extremism, a path of moderation. There's the teaching on Nirvana, which is perfect enlightenment, where it becomes clear that all dualities apparent in the world are a delusion. And that goes back to its origin in Hermetic philosophy, where uh, there's the two um, opposite ends of the pole. You have the pole of temperature, and one end is cold, and the other end is hot, but all these you know, varying degrees in between, where does cold end and hot begin? It doesn't really, because it's all just the same. It's, it looks like there's duality, but there's not, really. So um, that's one of the tenets of Hermetic philosophy, and Hermetic philosophy, as we talked about before, when we studied that way back in June, July, um, is the basis for almost all world religions. So that's why no matter what religion you study, you're going to see ideas of hermetic philosophy in it. <clears throat> and that's very clear on the teaching of um, uh, the middle way. Sentient beings suffer out of ignorance, craving and clinging, perpetuating reincarnation until they become enlightened and finally attain nirvana. Virtuous behavior. This is a big thing with them because they want to be rebirthed higher, not lower. Actions committed through the body, speech, or mind. Involving intentional effort. It has to be intentional. Moral purity of thought, word, and deed. They, they really they, they lead these more very, very moral lives. Also, calmness, quiet, and relinquishment of cravings. Uh, peace of mind, internal peace of mind. And peace in the community, which is external. Practicing these virtuous behaviors creates good karma and keeps one from being reincarnated in one of the four woeful realms. Therefore, so it's a the religious aspect of it is a religion of works. It's if you do good works you get higher. If you do bad works you end up in hell, kind of thing. And then, but it, their hell is not permanent because in that lifetime, in that lower hell, if you learn from it, then you can raise yourself back up and perhaps get reincarnated as a human again and have another shot. Because um, you need to be reincarnated as a human to have a shot at nirvana, because you have logic, and the animals don't have that ability to reason things out like we do. So that's, the re that's the religious aspect of it. It's a religion of works. <clears throat> uh, five precepts of virtuous behavior. Number one, I'm just, you're going to love these. Don't kill. Practice nonviolence against all sentient life. And sentient life is uh, animals as well as, as people, so they're vegetarians. Buddhists are vegetarians. Number two, don't steal. Number three, don't commit sensual misconduct. Number four, don't lie. And number five, don't be intoxicated, because in that state you will lose your mindfulness, and you need to be mindful so that you know what you're doing, so that you can better yourself. But look at these first four. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Right? Yeah. Totally in line with Christianity. So you can see why my friend, the Quaker, is a Buddhist in philosophy. Um, and the Buddhists take, it, take some of the things further. Um, for instance, I, I, I'm a vegetarian, but more for health reasons, um, I do not believe that it's immoral to kill an animal, and it's, I, I have nothing against eating meat. I've been not eating meat for like 10 years, so I just can't do it. It kind of grosses me out. Just, I, just, I just can't. It's not attractive to me anymore. I can't do it. But 
I don't think it is wrong. And like my whole family eats meat and they go hunt. And I, actually I want people to go hunting because there's too many deer in York County and it's dangerous and everybody's always hitting them. And so, you know, if you're a hunter, go thin them out. We need them thinned out and, you know, eat the meat or donate it to some family that needs it, please. Um, so I don't take it that far. Uh, but because of, they, of their belief of reincarnation, that's one reason that they don't want to kill an animal, let alone eat an animal, because it's kind of cannibalistic to them. <coughs> and you can see where, where they get that from. The cows walking That's Hindu. The, cow, the, okay. the Hindus uh, have, uh, cows are sacred to Hindu, okay. to Hinduism, yes. So and we're going to talk about Hinduism another week. Um, but yes, it's kind of along those same lines, though, because if you believe in reincarnation, you don't want to kill any animals. Um, so, you, but hey, I mean, they're right in line with the Ten Commandments, aren't they? I mean, that's almost word for word. And then the number five, don't be intoxicated. I mean, that's in, in uh, Proverbs, right? A Buddha is a fully awakened person who has freed his mind of the poisons of ignorance and desire. A Buddha is no longer in suffering, but at peace. Therefore, there is not just one Buddha. Anyone can become a Buddha, a Deva, a Brahmin. There are these different levels. There is a list of 28 Buddhas so far, uh, and this, this current one, this last one, is what we, who we refer to as the Buddha. I have this thing up there. Um, one of them. A common belief is that the next Buddha will be one named Maitreya or Mateya. That's an interesting little thing, because we're talking about end times, and I think that everything will converge, and, and because we, you have... Uh, you have a Islamic savior figure imam. that's coming. Imam. The Imam, Imam. Um, imam. You have the uh, the South American savior figure, Quetzalcoatl. Did I say that right? I didn't say that right. But you know the uh, the serpent winged dude. And then you have, of course, the Jewish Messiah, and uh, and then you know the Christian Messiah. We're looking for him to come back. So. You have all these different religions, and I uh, just wanted to point out that the Buddhists have one too. They have their uh, next, the, uh, their next Buddha that they're waiting for, because uh, this guy here has been gone for quite some time, since 500 BC. So the next Buddha is long overdue. Um, and the Dalai Lama is a teacher. But he's he's not he's not a Buddha. He's he's attained a certain level of holiness for sure, but he's not a Buddha. So um, you know, there's different Dalai Lamas, and the current Dalai Lama is that's Tibetan Buddhism, which is um, you know one like denomination, if you will, of the Buddhist philosophy. <coughs> I read um, the Universe in an Atom by the Dalai Lama. That's a neat book. It's a good perspective. There are an estimated 500 million Buddhists, depending on how you slice it. Buddhism is the fourth largest religion in the world after Christianity, Hinduism, and Islam. Buddhism was the first quote-unquote world religion, world meaning it was so widespread, because there were, I mean, like in India, there's so many millions, in China, my goodness, how many millions and billions of people are in China. That's why Buddhism is so large. But modern Buddhists argue that Buddhism is not a religion at all, but a philosophy of life. They have no central god. The Buddha is not deified. That's very important to the Buddhists that, because their god is the life force of the universe, the ocean itself, if you will. And each one of us has in us, because we all have the spark of divine in us, uh, it, according to their philosophy, that we could become a Buddha. So the Buddha is not God. And that's an important distinction because Christians always refer to Buddha as a false god. Buddha is not a god. He's not a god to them. Similar to how Catholics can pray to saints, Buddhists can leave a note at the Buddha statue. When, and, but they are putting their intentions out to the universe. They're not praying to him as a god. And um, I think it's important to understand these things because when you come across a Buddhist, you want to be able to understand what they believe so that you can not offend them and, and so that you can minister them effectively, share the gospel with them effectively, 
And you can't do that if you have these misconceptions. If you come out and you say, oh, well, you worship a false god. And they're like, you don't even know what you're talking about. Because I don't worship a false god. And Buddha's not a god. So you just alienated that person. I mean, they probably wouldn't say it that way because they're so gracious. <laughs> they're probably just like roll their eyes and wonder where you came from. But, but um, it's, a, it's an important distinction that they do not deify Buddha. Because all growing up in Christianity, I thought Buddha was a false god. And he's not. He's, he's a teacher. They have no authoritative scripture that binds the various sects of Buddhism. So they have no script. They have no Bible. They have no. Um, they have no uh, Quran type book. They have. They, there's um, <clears throat> different various writings, and, and Hinduism has more different scriptures. Um, I'm reading a book on the Bhagavad Gita. Um, it's Hinduism, and I want to talk about that another week. But uh, it's some really good stuff in there. But. Um, the Buddhists have no authoritative scripture, um, and they believe that anyone, Buddhist or not, can reach nirvana. They are not prejudiced against other religions. They don't think that you need to be Buddhist to reach nirvana. They think that it's okay if you don't, if you don't know the Buddha existed, if you are, you know, say you're, um, you know, you grew up in a third world country and you never even knew about Buddhism, but you took the time to think about things and became enlightened, you could become a, a Buddha yourself, so to speak. You could reach nirvana at some point, never having been a Buddhist. Because it's a philosophy, not a religion. And they don't push the religion. They push the philosophy. If not push, push is a bad word. Buddhists aren't pushy at all. Um, what we can learn from Buddhism, most of us can stand to be a lot more gentle in thought, word, and deed. <laughs> Our family especially is a rough group. Um, my father and I went and visited some cousins of his in Boston uh, about, a, about a year ago, I guess it was. And um, we realized that the way we joke is, is by jabbing and making fun of each other, all in good fun, and actually lovingly. But our sense of humor that has developed in our family is to put each other down. <laughs> now, within our own family unit, the 15 of us, it's okay because we relate to one another that way. We walk in the room and we make fun of the other person and they volley it back and we volley back light insults, right? It doesn't hurt our feelings. We're tough. We've been in real estate all the time, right? But we realize that we have these gentler cousins and we gotta be careful not to hurt their feelings. Because if one of them walks in a room and you haven't seen him for a while, you go, whoa, man, you aged. <laughs> you know, you can't say that. It hurts people's feelings. So, you know, my father and I came back from that saying, Ooh, you know, we really need to be careful not to hurt our relatives' feelings. But we can stand to be a lot more gentle in word, thought, and deed. Um, we're, we, Westerners in general, are rough compared to our Eastern philosophy counterparts. <clears throat> Our craving and clinging often cause us to suffer needlessly. Uh, it's a different take on the Catholic serenity prayer. Lord, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Oh, you've probably all heard the serenity prayer. <clears throat> and that is definitely in line with Buddhism. If you, I mean, just be at peace with it. Change it if you can. If you can't, it's okay. Um, Number three, most often it is not a treacherous person or a difficult circumstance that is the problem, but wrong thinking itself. It takes great humility to see this. Ego and pride are often masked as righteous anger. There is a place for righteous anger, and Jesus threw the money changers out of the temple. But how often do we really have a situation like that? I mean, we get righteous anger over everything. Um, and I'm a very, very patriotic American. So I can say this with a clear conscience. We take our rights way too far. I'm for equal rights for everyone, yes. But as an individual, we have this rights thing built up in our mind to something that it's not. You're standing in line and someone butts in front of you and you feel like your rights have been violated and you get all this righteous anger all built up. Well, you don't know what that person's going through. Maybe they're in a hurry because they need to get back to somebody that's desperate need for their, you know, for their help. Maybe they came across as a little bit rude to you. Let it go, man. You know, but we have all these rights, rights, rights that we're always standing up for our rights. That's, I mean, what? Pick 
pick your battles, right? Um, so ego and pride are often masked as righteous anger. <clears throat> uh, how does one share Jesus with a Buddhist? Sincerely appreciate their peaceful worldview because we can learn so much from them. Find common ground. Their five precepts are totally in line with our Ten Commandments. Their selflessness and having no ego is taught in the Bible. They view, this is important, they view Jesus as an equal to the Buddha. So use Jesus' own gentle words when, when witnessing to them. <clears throat> um, give them a New Testament. Depending on the situation, perhaps avoid the Old Testament when first witnessing to Buddhists. It's funny because we talk a lot about witnessing to the Jews. You want to talk only from the Old Testament when you're witnessing to the Jews. But when you're witnessing to Buddhists and Hindus, you, you want to use the New Testament. You want to use Je because Jesus is gentle. And they're not going to understand the, the violence of the Old Testament. There was a lot of violence in the Old Testament. And although it's a historical record of what happened, and although we know that there are very good reasons when God said, go in and wipe out those people, it's because those people were sacrificing their children by burning them alive to Molech. And that's why they had to be killed. But if you don't know that background, God comes across as pretty harsh. So rather than having to start by explaining why the violence was necessary, just don't go there yet. And since they know who Jesus was and they respect him as a peaceful teacher, they love the Sermon on the Mount. So that's a good place to start with the Buddhists is the Sermon on the Mount because Jesus preached meekness, which is authority under control. Meekness isn't weakness. Meekness isn't be a pushover. Meekness is authority under control. I love that. Um, <clears throat> So the New Testament is good. And then pray that the Holy Spirit reveals Jesus to them through the scriptures and engage in conversation frequently to show them the real love of Christianity because we have some repair work to do. So that's a little bit about Buddhism. <clears throat>